Hello, I'm Rod Garvin, SVP of Talent Insights for the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. I also serve as Executive Director of the CLT Alliance Foundation. Uh, we have three special guests today, uh, and it's rare that I have the opportunity to talk to uh, three professors um, with universities in our region. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, to your top left, um, Dr. Adolphus Belk, who's Professor of Political Science at Winthrop University. Um, we also have Dr. Terza Lehman Neves, uh, who is Professor of Political Science at Johnson C. Smith University. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Crystal Eddins, who is Professor of Africana Studies at UNC Charlotte. Uh, would like to say that uh, I'm a proud 49er. I'm a graduate of UNC Charlotte. Um, mm -hmm. Actually received a minor in what was then African and African American Studies. Uh, and I'm an honorary Golden Bull by way of my wife, Akila. So um, I got to find that Winthrop connection, but I guess since I know you, Adolphus, you know, I, I can, I can claim my connection that way. All love. Um, <laughs> um, you know, getting started, um, obviously this is a very important time in our country. Um, you know, we're dealing with a, a global health pandemic and we're also dealing with what I think we could call a um, hundred years of a racial pandemic as well. Um, but we're talking about that. We're addressing uh, that particular issue in a new way. Um, the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey, um, and all of the response to that um, has created a moment for change, at least the potential for significant change. Um, there's definitely dialogue that's happening in a way that we haven't seen before um, across all areas of our society, um, not only in our academic uh, institutions and um, in politics, but also within business um, and the world of economic development that the Charlotte Alliance is a part of. Um, it's a big topic and we're gonna see how much we can cover uh, in 40 to 45 minutes. Um, for those who are, who are really just now um, seeking a deeper understanding of, of not only racism, uh, institutional systemic racism and anti-black racism, um, you know, how, how, would, how would you start? Um, because one of the challenges, we have to put these issues in um, historical context. It's not just something that um, has erupted out of a vacuum. So we need a base understanding um, of race, of, of racial history, um, and how this current activism uh, sits within um, a long history um, of social movements. So that's a really big open-ended question, um, but I'm just gonna throw it out there and, and see where we go. Um, Teresa, let's, let's start with you. Please share anything you want to um, on that very broad topic. Sorry about that. I had, um, I said, how did I know you were going to go there? And of course, <laughs> I'm, the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that I'm the only non-U.S. Uh, born Black on this panel. <laughs> can, can I assume that? And he, I and, believe and, that and is correct. Like, and I say, well, you know, I, I just feel like he's going to pick on me first. I feel that um, <laughs> I should be maybe the second to speak to that, um, the second person, and uh, giving the floor to my American-born uh, Black colleagues to, to tackle that question first, because I, I'll be coming from the global, the, the African continent perspective. So out of respect for not only uh, the, the scholarship, but the background of my colleagues, I'll let um, I'll let one of them go first and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll join, I'll come back in. Is that okay? That's perfectly fine. Yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for Crystal or Adolphus. Yes. Um, sure. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I think it's really interesting. I, I, when I was looking you up, I, I remember seeing that you're uh, Cape Verdean. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so I think it's really important to really have that global perspective, um, especially given those kind of early interactions when, uh, through, uh, between the Portuguese and West Africans in terms of the origins of the slave trade and really those moments being the beginnings of where we come to understand race as uh, a modern phenomenon. Um, so, you know, my work really begins at that moment as well in terms of looking at um, 15th century European colonial expansion um, which 
two components, right? These acts of genocide toward the indigenous Americans in order to expropriate land and resources, and then the trafficking of 12 million African captives to the Caribbean, South America, and North America. So we have to remember that these enslaved Africans were not only forced to work for no compensation, their actual bodies were forms of capital, right? For enslavers to accumulate wealth. Um, so modern US American capitalism was birthed by the cotton industry as we know, and uh, was fueled, which was fueled by enslaved people's labor. So in the United States, particularly this idea that labor can be ex forcefully extracted from black people and that black people should not be you know, free self-determining people goes beyond just the antebellum period before 1865, but also shows up in things like the convict leasing system, where Jim Crow laws allowed for indiscriminate policing of black communities and funneled those prisoners into agricultural and industrial labor, um, the sharecropping system, which was practiced in 19, until the 1960s and 70s in some areas. Uh, my own father came from a sharecropping family in Alabama. And then of course, you know, mass incarceration, right? So um, I also think of examples of how the US government was explicit or com complicit in extracting wealth from African Americans through redlining of the housing system, uh, sanctioning white mob violence that destroyed self-sufficient communities like the Wilmington massacre of 1898 here in North Carolina and the 1921 Tulsa massacre, which uh, was just kind of commemorated recently with um, the the Trump rally that was just uh, that just occurred there. So these historical patterns, I think, contribute directly to the way mainstream America often associates black people with criminality and how per poverty is perpetuated. So just for one last like recent exa example, when we, when we see that how my, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, and the Department of Justice investigated the local de police department, it was found that the police were literally funding themselves by targeting the black community for various fines and tickets and things of that sort. So when we talk about um, racism being a foundational part of our national fabric, um, I, I think it's important to look at the specifics of what that means. And our economic system is the central component that continues to reproduce racial inequality and oppression. Yeah, Crystal, and they weren't just funding the police department, they were funding the entire municipality. Absolutely. Because it was fine on top of fine, right? There's the initial fine, and then there's the failure to pay, and the accumulation of fines, and that money was being used to generate revenue to fund the entire city, right? So a lot of troublesome things there. For my part, Rod, I want to go back to two luminaries. I want to take it back to W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin. And W.E.B. Du Bois said this in 1906 in The Color Line Belts the World. Most Americans are simply tired and impatient over our most sinister social problem, the problem, the Negro. They do not want to solve it. They do not want to understand it. They simply, they want to simply be done with it and to hear the last of it. Of all possible attitudes, this is the most dangerous. To that, James Baldwin would later add, white America remains unable to believe that black America's grievances are real. And it's those tendencies that have gotten us to this point the hostility of indifference and the sheer awfulness of neglect because people have made this argument for quite some time. We can go back to the late 1960s and find people in the civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, the Combahee River Collective movement who were highlighting the problems of state sanctioned violence, police officers acting as judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to black people who were accused of even minor transgressions. So these are deeply rooted problems that have been around for quite some time, but at the heart of it, people either don't believe us when we say that it happens, or they simply don't care. One of the things that's been especially brutal about the killing of George Floyd is that a 17 year old sister stood there and recorded it for everyone to see. And it was just awful, right? Like eight, 
minutes, 46 seconds on this man's neck as other people surrounded them and begged for his life. Then we watched this man in his dying moments call out for his mama who had died two years earlier. So it's hard to be indifferent after that has been broadcast around the nation and the world. And after people, these young people now, who grew up in a post Trayvon Martin America, where these murders have been on loop, finally old enough to say, no, we're not taking it anymore. We're going to do something about it. And they've led demonstrations across now, all 50 states for the last month. And, and even the world. Uh, right. Which, which is a great transition to Tirza for, for yeah. an international perspective. Absolutely. And so what we see here is that, um, I know your question dealt with, you know, not the national history, but the world is now seeing what's happening in the United States, but also the United States now has a U.S. citizens, um, has, uh, has an ability to see how this has actually um, sparked protests and demonstrations and uprisings throughout the world because um, black lives have not married all over the world, right? And so um, being, being an African, being from a very uh, small, newly independent African state because Cape Verde only, uh, received, only uh, struggled and gained its independence from Portugal in 1975. So that's pretty early. And we, we see what colonialism and imperialism and, and white supremacy has done on the African continent and beyond. So I think what this has done, um, not that I'm saying it hasn't happened in the past, but it, it really has increased the interest in our understanding of this um, of this white supremacist and this racism, this systemic racism at a global level, at a global level, and how that impacts um, black people, not just in the United States, in other states like Brazil. Uh, Brazil is going through very similar situations that are happening in the United States right now with the murder of black uh, of black people by by, by the state, right? Um, so um, it's it's very much an interesting time. But like my colleague says, I'm, 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 I remain optimistic because the people are not just sitting around anymore um, and, and, and just talking about it. They're taking it to the streets. And this is happening globally. And that makes me very excited and, uh, about what this could mean. You know, um, it's uncomfortable for some, but I think we need to be uncomfortable in order for this change to happen. And that's why I'm very, very optimistic because there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations taking place right now. Appreciate all the comments. Um, you know, Crystal, you really um, masterfully, you know, laid down uh, the historical, social, political, even economic context. You did that in five minutes, which was <laughs> very impressive. Um, you know, Adolphus, you, you kind of raised the important issues of, you know, what's what's happening in, in this moment and what was the, the spark. Um, and, um, you know, love how you, you talked about how technology and, you know, uh, phone um, video technology is, is really playing in. We know that um, police involved shootings and anti-black racism and violence isn't new, but how it's being documented is new. Um, which has led to new personalities. And Teresa, the, the global uh, dimensions, the international aspect of this is important because you know, racism and white supremacy is not, not uniquely American um, in, in terms of this being the United States. It actually, we actually inherited it, right? Um, um, from other parts of the world. So um, it's amazing how what's happening here that was resonating and, and how we have the potential for uh, global change um, you know, there's somewhat of a debate in terms of, you know, how similar or different is this particular moment, um, this social movement that we're seeing as it relates to the previous um, historic moments, the civil rights movement in particular of the 50s and 60s, and what we saw in particular after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What, what parallels are you all seeing and what would you say is very unique and different uh, in terms of the activism and the social movement? Uh, that is emerging right now. Um, whoever wants to take that one. Well, I would say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And there are some rhythms here. So if I go back to 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, people were demanding equal accommodations. They demanded that the federal government withhold resources from any program that practiced discrimination. 
They were arguing for job training and jobs programs for the unemployed. And finally, they were demanding a living wage back in 1963. Three years later, the Black Panther Party emerges in Oakland, California, formed essentially out of a conflict against police brutality. But among other things, they call for full employment, vastly improved housing and education, an end to police brutality, an end to mass imprisonment, and justice and peace. A decade later, the queer Black feminists of the Combahee River Collective were champion championing an integrated analysis and practice to dismantle interlocking systems of oppression, noting that as a, a sister friend in the profession, a Dr. Melanie Price likes to say that bigots are rarely narrow in their hatred. It doesn't take much to transition from anti-blackness or racism to sexism to homo antagonism. And more recently, when we look at the Black Lives Matter Global Network or the Movement for Black Lives, those entities have been abolitionist, anti-capitalist and even pro-reparations. So when I look at this particular moment in time, you have people who are arguing for things that should have been, and they're arguing for things that should have been following the abolition of enslavement and the reconstruction era, and those things were stripped away. They're arguing for things that people agitated for in the 1960s with the civil rights and black power movements. Those things were either only done partially or neglected. When King was at arguing for people to have human and civil rights, they were also pushing for what they described as civil rights, real economic opportunity, right? And King argued, you can't do this on the cheap, that if you're going to eradicate social injustice and economic injustice, it's going to cost you as a nation. If those things had been done in these earlier eras, we would be a better, stronger nation right now, but they were not done or they were systematically undone. So here we are. And when I look at the demands that are coming from this generation of leaders in this moment, police brutality is an issue, but they're looking at police brutality as a symptom of larger systemic and institutional problems that go back to racism and anti-Blackness. So they seem to be more serious about dismantling those interlocking systems of oppression and developing a better functioning society that can work for all. Chris, did you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think that was a, a really great um, analysis of the ways that these different progressive communities that emerged, especially in the late 60s and 70s, have um, kind of set the model for the ways that uh, mobilizers today are really articulating and kind of pushing the envelope forward. Um, one of the things that I also have kind of taken note of or, or noticed in terms of who is doing the organizing and who is in these spaces, like Adolphus mentioned, um, we're seeing so many more um, Black, queer, LGBT youth and women um, at the center of this organizing. And I think it's because of the work of people, of groups like the Combahee Collective, um, the Black Panther Party and, and other organizations that, and other scholars who have really articulated the fact that the folks who are at the at the margins of society who are who are most marginalized are no one is going to be free unless they're free right no one is going to be or, or have liberation until those groups are are liberated and and centered and so i think it's really interesting to to see that pattern emerge and kind of come into fruition when we're seeing so many um so many people uh, from these various communities that are at the center of organizing and really, like you said, kind of pushing the envelope and being really serious and being really intentional about what it means to um, dismantle systems that oppress all people um, on the various axes of our identities and um, and and experiences. So it's not just about uh, identity politics. It's about um, the actual lived experience that that people encounter and the um, different types of disenfranchisement and dispossession that um, that folk are more likely to encounter because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexuality, etc. Um, so I think that it, it's really exciting to see um, to see some of that th those newer developments. I want to follow that that line of thinking um, because it it is inter interwoven. Um, I think you know rightfully attention is really focused on uh, criminal justice, law enforcement, um, 
the interactions of black and brown people with, with police. Um, but, but you all raise how interconnected issues of, you know, racial inequity as, as um, economic system comes into play, um, how we think about health disparities, um, even, you know, voter suppression and, and, and other issues. Um, so I am hoping that this, this moment gives us an opportunity to address um, racial injustice in a very holistic way. Um, and I think that may get lost if we're, if we're not really intentional about that. Um, want to continue with, with the economic aspect in particular. Um, I, I mentioned earlier how what, what's really unique for me is the way in which business is weighing in um, in this particular moment. And we've you know, seen countless statements uh, from businesses and other organizations um, uh, pronouncing their commitment to um, racial justice, to equality, um, to trying to be a part of the solution. Um, so I want to get your thoughts in terms of, you know, what, what's the next step that you want to see from businesses? Um, we've, we've announced our, our commitment. Um, our vision is to create the most vibrant, innovative, and healthy economy in the nation. And we helped, um, uh, we crafted a statement that really reaffirms that commitment, uh, in particular as it relates to prosperity for all, uh, and making sure that we're doing that through a lens of, of racial equity. Um, diversity and inclusion, um, but we know so much more has to be done. What would you like to see from businesses as a next step, um, in particular as it relates to um, uh, racial equity in our, in our economics, uh, in terms of how we do business, in terms of how we think about talent, um, who we're hiring, who we're developing, who we're promoting? Well, I would say that um, there are 40 million plus Black Americans in the United States who are themselves very diverse, right? Um, that's larger than the population of Canada. And we wouldn't expect all Canadians to think and behave the same politically or socially. And since 1965, as a result of a somewhat bit of liberalization with American immigration laws, those Black folk are now coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. They're coming from the Caribbean. They're coming from Central and South America, really all over the world. That said, there are still some common restraints obstacles to people achieving their economic goals and objectives. When we talk about the presence of racism in American society in general or in the economy, we're talking about more than the attitudes and actions of individual people. We're talking about how policies and practices can erect and maintain inequality. Oliver and Shapiro in their work talk about the cumulative advantages and disadvantages that have developed over time, sort of like sediment rock. And if we think about how sediment rock forms, it's layer upon layer upon layer over time. So you have 240 years of Jim Crow, layer. A century, well, you have 240 years of enslavement, layer. 90 years of Jim Crow, layer. 50 years of racist economic and housing policy, layer. You have companies right now that are sort of virtue signaling respecting the power of black Americans as consumers. Yet some of the people they could have really used to guide them through this moment are the people they criticize for speaking out, the people they fired or dismissed for speaking out, the people that they ignored all this time who were trying to point out the problems in their respective companies and or in their industries. It's one thing to make a statement where you look outward and talk about the problems of racism in the larger society. It's quite a different thing for you to then look inward and examine your own institutional practices, behaviors, the value of your, your company, the culture of your company to say, have we been part of the solution or have we been part of the problem? And if we've been part of the problem, what are we going to do to open up economic opportunities for the people who patronize us, but also for the people that work here? That's a different conversation. And so I'm much more interested in seeing people address those big issues within their companies and industries than I am at being satisfied with symbolic changes like Aunt Mama and Uncle Ben and putting black content on my streaming services. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Very good point. Um, points raised there. Um, to your points, um, I'm, I'm critical of the uh, 
of corporate America or in the business uh, world uh, for those reasons as well. Um, because everyone is throwing around, I think, buzzwords. Everyone, I think all companies are, uh, you know, most companies want to be on the right side of history right now. So everyone is issuing the correct statements with the correct concepts. And, but, I, you know, anti racism work really doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes, uh, conversations, but it also goes beyond conversations. It takes, it's not going to take five to, to 10 years, for example. Um, as we know, you know, the, you know, racism has been here for hundreds of years. And so what are we doing? Um, so we have to be more creative and more innovative than that. And also what sort of relationships are we in addition to our own work, right? And I say our own work, these com the companies, in addition to the work that they're doing internally to see how they've added to the, the, the issues, the, the challenges faced in society, what kind of community relationships have you built in the past, right? So if we think about Charlotte, for example, I'm thinking about the companies that have issued these amazing statements, but what sort of relationships do you have with the only historically black college um, in the city, for example? How long has that existed? Uh, what types of opportunities are you really providing to the students that are coming out of J uh, JCSU as a premier HBCU? So we're talking about some concrete conversations and actions here with the understanding that it's not going to just happen right away, right? So um, as my colleague mentioned here, this is a culture, and that's going to uh, a culture shift takes a very long time. And it, again, we go back to those uncom uncomfortable conversations and actions, and, and all of that has to happen. So you need to do some, uh, I'd suggest some deep soul searching coupled with um, really studying the types of relationships that you've built in your community and the reasons, the intentions behind those relationships. Are they long-term? Or are you just trying to make sure that you fit the bill for to meet the quota for this anti-racism conversation or Black Lives Matter to make sure you're filling on all the all the right boxes that you've done what you're supposed to do? Because there are still people, um, as I said, there's still people being fired for uh, wearing Black Lives Matter masks at their you know jobs. Uh, you know this is what's really going on to the people, right? Uh, and so that would be my two senses on, 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 on what folks can really do. Well said, well said. Um, we, we have to have some uncomfortable conversations. This conversation is going to make some people uncomfortable, um, which, which is absolutely what, what has to happen. Um, and you're right, you know, we, we, the, the dialogue is important, the conversation is important, the statements are important. Um, but what we want to do is, is really help businesses navigate um, this current moment and opportunity uh, into concrete action, because that's the only way um, we're going to get to greater equity and inclusion, uh, you know, not only in terms of race, but um, across all demographics. So um, really appreciate those comments. You know, thinking about um, young people and, you know, want to look at this in a couple ways. One. Uh, we know that most social movements have been led by young people. Um, two, when we think about talent, uh, the talent that businesses need, um, a lot of those individuals um, that we think of, those in the pipeline, um, are young people, those who you're working with each and every day. Um, wanted to ask, you know, what you're hearing um, from the students, you know, what are they thinking about? Um, how are you all um, engaging with and supporting students? not only as professors, but also, you know, how are your universities um, responding in this particular time? Crystal, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, so our department chair at the uh, UNCC uh, Africana Studies Department recently organized a monthly online forum to discuss the impact of COVID-19, uh, police brutality, and other forms of racism and, and inequality in our healthcare and our educational and economic systems. Um, so that's been one way that um, we've been trying to kind of connect with the broader community, uh, with the UNC Charlotte community. Um, myself, uh, based on conversations that I've had with, with students, um, it does suggest that they are really affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, our student body is predominantly Black, predominantly uh, mostly first-generation college students. 
um, including some who are non-traditional students, like returning students and, and working parents. Um, so I've communicated with some who are, who are currently working as essential employees. Um, other folks have, have lost their jobs. Um, and then other folks still have, have lost family members to the coronavirus. So uh, knowing that you know, people of African descent in the United States are more likely to be impacted by the coronavirus and, and the economic fallout um, from, the, um, from all of the, the social distancing and the closings, I think has really had a direct impact on our student body here. And um, it's hard to, to um, express how to, um, how to be a, a strong support system for the students when we are trying to still socially distance, um, but at the same time, trying to use the, the technologies and the tools that we have to reach out to them and to at least at a minimum kind of be a resource and a sounding board to, um, to express these, these things. I know that earlier in the spring, um, I had a family member uh, also pass away from the virus. And so just trying to kind of share, um, share space and, and uh, stand in solidarity with them to let them know that, you know, they're, they're not alone and that, you know, the processes of, of mourning and loss and grief that we're all kind of going through right now is something that's going to uh, be with us for some time. And so that was just, you know, one thing that I felt that I could do was to kind of share with them what I was going through so that they had some sense that, um, that this was not, um, that they, you know, weren't alone and that they weren't experiencing these things in, in isolation. And so um, regarding activism and, and civic engagement, um, I've tried to kind of uh, be present in some of the um, some of the workshops and and um, and the I'm sorry the um, there was a a commemoration I'm sorry for for George Floyd not very long ago and again mostly organized by and and was had a heavy presence of of young folks there and so even with the um, with everything that's going on, I think that there's still a really strong sense of resilience among um, young people on our campus as well as in the city of Charlotte more broadly. And you know, it's it, or terrorism. Sorry about that. Um, um, what you're talking about, it, it's so, it speaks to the work that us, particularly you know, African American, Black and African American um, faculty have to do. Um, regardless of where you work, HBCU or not, um, particularly at PWIs, the types of support that we provide to our students, to, um, to our Black and um, people of color, being that extra layer of support that they may not have. And um, this speaks volumes to it. Um, at JCSU, but we, we, we've also had some social justice conversations hosted by, um, planned by the student activities office. Uh, I've been part of a couple of um, those conversations uh, similar to these. Um, inclusive of the president, he's been very supportive. Um, the president of the university sending out messages, making sure that both faculty and students um, are hearing from him um, on a regular. But the main thing that I think uh, that I've done as, as, a, as a faculty member and as a support of my students is just to be there and listen. Because this also, um, at this point, they all have my cell phone number. And um, they know that they can text me, they can call me at reasonable times. And, 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 and just, you know, and just check in. And for those that I've built um, relationships with on a, a, a deeper level, I, I check in on them because I know their personal situations. And um, they just need to, you know, just say, hey, are you okay? is today a good day and so um th this is a really tough time for for many of them for most of them um, and ourselves as well right um and so um just just to being able to check in has been very very important um i think that's the one thing that our students need is just to to be able to to have someone 
um, a community that just listens. That's important. Yeah, right. Um, you preceded your remarks by talking about all of these statements that have come out. And one of the things that was recently noted in a piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education is that college leaders have issued statements denouncing bigotry and pledging their commitment to diversity, but critics have denounced some of these statements as insufficient and toothless, that they hit some of the right points, but they don't name the thing, and the thing being racism. So at my university at Winthrop, we've had people who are pushing the university to do something greater, something more powerful than statements alone. And we're trying to get people to explore what the American Political Science Association described as the linkages between race, power, governance, social injustice, and oppression. And we want to do that by examining the state and our nation, but also paying special attention to our university. And so when I think about where these young people are coming from, they understand some of what's going on, right? That this is a generation that's seen a lot of hardship and downturns, and they've come of age in that, and they want to do something about it. They have a genuine commitment, I think, to making a better world. One of the things that's made these demonstrations different from some of the others is that you have a multiracial, multi-ethnic group out here, in addition to these Black people who within their group are diverse, right? And that's something that's heartening. So the young people who have talked to us want to understand what's happening, why it's happening, and they want to know what specific things they can do to deal with aspects of the problem. At Winthrop last week, we had a forum, uh, the beginning of something, the Diversity Dialogues, a discussion on racism. And while much of the interest coming into it was about renaming campus buildings, we were focused as organizers on staying square on the main thing. And as our colleague, Dr. Lester Spence likes to say, let the main thing be the main thing. And the main thing, systemic racism, anti-blackness, police brutality, those specific problems. So these young people have said, what can we do to deal with these specific problems that we know have been going on for quite some time, but we are now determined to confront? Well said, well said Adolphus. One of the things I am encouraged by is how uh, multiracial and multi-ethnic this current coalition is. Um, that is something that makes it, it unique. You know, we, we, we saw the civil rights movement become more diverse over time, but this really, um, I'm not gonna say from the inception because there, as it relates to Black Lives Matter, there was a lot of work on the front end um, that was, was led primarily by Black and African American people. Um, three black women in particular, um, who were known as the founders of um, Black Lives Matter. Um, but in terms of this current moment, uh, it, it seems to be multiracial, multi active from the, from the inception, which I think is really important and necessary um, for the type of change that we want to see. Um, th this last question um, uh, is inspired by Dr. King. Um, he had a book that, that some will be familiar with called uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community? He wrote it shortly before he was assassinated in 1968. It's been 52 years since Dr. King's death and the national protest that followed, which you know, I think we've discussed is probably the most recent moment that is similar to what we're experiencing right now, um, although we've acknowledged some differences. Um, Teresa, you said that we're not gonna solve this in five to 10 years, but I want to imagine where maybe we could be um, in, in five to 10 years if we, if we take the necessary steps, if we translate dialogue into action, into policy reform, into changing organizational practices. Um, what would you like to see? Um, this will be our, our closing remarks and I'll, I'll start with you, Teresa. So uh, one of the things that I've been really thinking about in, uh, I've been thinking about building community, right? And so, um, so building inwards in, in, and then asking folks to do some work outwards. So I'm thinking about the black community and, how, and, and the immigrant community. Um, I recently wrote a piece that I published and about what does it mean to be the good immigrant, the model immigrant, um, particularly as it relates to Cape Verdeans and other um, immigrant, black immigrant communities in the US um, and our, um, uh, how, what should I call this? Um, the, the default mode that we go normally is to just uh, just stay silent on these matters because somehow we feel that 
that is going to impact our standing within the larger community. So we stay silent on a lot of matters. So um, in that piece, I talk about that we have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with the black, uh, with, with the African American community, and and I lay out my 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 reasons why. I think that um, and, and there's a lot of critique by um, um, black immigrant communities that talk about um, looting as a horrible thing. This is not the way to create change. There's a lot of um, what we call the Facebook experts on how is this going to happen, right? And so one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is um, and having conversations with, within my community and with my students is to make space and be flexible on, on what the change looks like and make, be flexible with uh, that different voices and different ways of going about this change is actually okay, right? So everyone has a role to play in this change so that the, the the black community is better organized that way right so i think that especially with the influx of social media and the impact and uh of uh, of what um it's been able to do uh to let us see the atrocities and 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 the overt racism that is happening um we need to make space um, as Black people for all types of um, uprisings and um, a voice to, to, to wanting to, to create revolution and change the system or create change. And so that I would say within um, the com building the community because I'm, I'm going to be honest and say that I, I don't know what, I don't know if we're going to see immediate change in five to 10 years in government and policies and all of that, because we're still waiting for Breonna Taylor's, uh, uh, you know, the, those officers to be to be charged, right? They've been fired, but they've not been held legally responsible for what they've done. So I'm not sure, but I can tell you that I remain optimistic because I do see the space being created, um, uh, as Crystal mentioned, for the different types of uh, black leaders within our own community and the flexibility of, uh, for, uh, of us listening to all, especially to young people. So um, I remain optimistic about, uh, about that. And, and, and that's where I see within five to 10 years, that's the game changer. Thank you, Teresa. Crystal? Yeah, I, um, I definitely think that, you know, like you just mentioned, you know, listening to the voices of young people and the, the critiques that they're leveling is gonna be, hopefully, you know, a path to beginning to make some of these transformational changes. Um, so when I think about the, the years after Martin Luther King died, and, or the, rather the years right before he died, um, and the, the types of changes that he was really advocating for, uh, bringing an end to racial discrimination, um, but also ending American material, uh, m m m t militarism, bringing an end to American um, militarism abroad, as well as ending poverty um, domestically and the interconnectedness between those three, um, those three things. Um, so when I think about how much we as a nation have invested so much money into the quote unquote war on terrorism, um, which is ostensibly still going on 20 years later, um, and we've also poured money into policing and incarceration in the past several decades. Um, so we've, we have national and local budgets increasing funding to police and prisons. Meanwhile, we're cutting funding to schools, cutting funding to our healthcare system, cutting funding to housing. And so we have to, I think now is the most important time to begin to ask ourselves, how is it that our police have militarized gear and all of these, you know, weapons and, and toys as some of the, you know, activist community likes to call them, but so many hospitals weren't equipped to handle the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Um, how do we move forward with these kinds of, um, with these kinds of imbalances? And so I think it's these kinds of funding disparities that has prompted for young people and young protesters to call for hashtag defund the police, right? And begin to transfer those funds back into communities um, and resources like schools and housing, jobs, healthcare, mental healthcare, 
uh, family services so that we can hopefully begin to live in a world where police and prisons are no longer needed. And I think that, I think now is a time when we're seeing that that's not something that's, um, that's impossible or, or far-fetched or um, a utopian vision for 30, 40, 50 years down the line. These are things that um, city councils and, and mayors and governors can begin to, to do now, especially with the, um, with the pressure that is being leveled. Thank you, Crystal. When I th Office, you have the last word. Yeah, when I think about this, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed how much our childcare is connected to schooling. It's revealed how much our healthcare is connected to our work and having health insurance provided through work. And then the uprisings have demonstrated just how many resources are going not toward educational, social, and economic services, but toward social control through policing. You have medical professionals that are improvising protective gear right now, while the police are equipped with more body armor and weaponry than people had when they invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. So when people are talking about defunding the police, what they're really saying is, let's think about core police functions. What should the police be doing? What are they doing? And are they doing things that they shouldn't be doing? And if we can take the those functions and dollars away from them, but put it in a more productive and effective place, then that's money well spent. We have officers that, and Colin Kaepernick raised this point when he started his demonstrations in 2016. We have officers that have less training, fewer hours of training than someone holding a curling iron and they have a gun. As an educator, I make mistakes, but my mistakes don't have funerals. And if I make mistakes, there are mechanisms that can hold me accountable for the things that I've said and done. Um, we don't see that accountability in terms of law enforcement. So the reason I think we have to be in a better place, and this is me speaking as an intellectual, a professional, but also as a human being. In 10 years, I'm going to have a 17-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son, and I need a better world for them. And because I need a better world for them, I'm willing to do the sort of things that can help us think through and ultimately develop that better world. And if policies and programs created this mess, then better policies and programs ought to be part of the solution. Thanks to all of you. Um, this has been a fascinating and insightful conversation, a much needed conversation, um, you know, as, as expressed, not a conversation that frankly would have even been possible. Um, were it not for this moment within this context, uh, this world of, of business and economic development that I'm a part of, you know, so we have to seize the moment, you know, we have to have the conversation while we can and create the change that we want to see. Um, we have to strike while the iron is hot, as they say. Um, so I appreciate your time. Um, hope that we can touch base later um, and, and see where we are and, and have another conversation and bring your perspectives in. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing every day. Thank you for you know, educating and empowering our students um, who are our, our current and future talent, who are the leaders of tomorrow. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.